Well, welcome back. Um, we were in Montana. Uh, we had a breakdown and had to park the rig. And uh, I think we were coming back from uh, Andrews University. And the truck needed to go into the shop for some work on the radiator. So they gave us a rental and we were at the Bear Mountains in Montana. And so at driving up and down the little canyons, we took a couple of days just to enjoy some of the beautiful scenery there in Montana and Sherry snapped this picture. Um, just absolutely a lovely country there. Uh, I can see why people want to live in Montana. It's got some big mountains and big prairies. Uh, so thank you, Sherry. Uh, just like to linger for a moment, enjoy the brilliant blue sky I think these are uh, fall pictures uh, and just lovely. So thank you for that, Sherry. All right, let's uh, move on. Uh, Revelation, a book for today, a book for right now. We are looking into chapter 20. So as God is revealing how he sees this being finished, John writes down his visions that becomes his word. And you will clearly see that God is on your side. These are the last things. As we go through 2021 20, and 22, these are the last events that happen in the universe in regards to evil. They are just the beginning, excuse me, the beginning of things that happen to the redeemed. Are you with me on that? So enjoy the scriptures, the intensity and the vindication that Christ has for you. In, and I hope you enjoy this. Let's go on to chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. Remember in 19, we just had the great suppers. All right, if you haven't listened to that presentation, you need to go back and, and remember that presentation to get the context for chapter 20. So this angel comes down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Verse 2, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So after Christ comes and takes his church away from the earth, Satan is now taken and confined to the bottomless pit, this abyss, this void. And I'm going to say my argument would be profoundly simple. This would be the earth completely void of anything on it. There has been a judgment. There has been the supper of the birds. There is nothing left but for this thousand years where he is bound and a seal is set on him so he cannot deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years are finished. Um, but at the end, he will be released for a little while, the text says, that Satan spends 1,000 years seeing the consequences of his rebellion. He cannot leave. He cannot go anywhere. He is simply bound to this vast abyss. The bottomless pit, that language implies a void. He gets that for a 1,000 years to contemplate. Now, you could argue that the thousand years is not literal. Well, if you choose that argument, I'm not going to disagree, but I'm going to say for a really, really long time from our perspective. Notice in verse 4, and I saw thrones. John's now looking from earth to heaven, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, then I saw, <clears throat> saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So this is such an extraordinary vision because now John is seeing the, the full effect and completion here of the gospel of the redeemed in the heavenly realm. But he saw the apostate church merge with civil power and become the persecutor. Now he's seeing the final outcome, that final judgment in the heavenly realm as Satan is bound on the earth. There are consequences for sin. And that is called a judgment, an examination. Is God a just and fair God? Notice verse 5. 
The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This would be Christ's second coming. Blessed and holy is he, is he who has a part in the first resurrection over the second over such the second death has no power. But they shall be the priests of God and of Christ and they shall reign with him a thousand years. So understand this. <clears throat> that when we talk about the final judgment, it is called the second death. But if you are resurrected and still alive when Christ comes, you have victory over the second death. It has no power over you. It is referred to a death, not immortality being tortured forever. And to be a priest means that you are a, one who serves in the household of God and you will reign with him in his house for a thousand years. Now notice verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, will go out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, that's the prince and the, of the, evil, the evil prince and the evil city, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sands of the sea. Now, Abraham was promised his descendants would be as the sands of the sea. Satan's victory to get people to follow him has also numbered as the sands of the sea. That is how many people who bought into the deception, who bought into Satan's lie. I want you to pause for a moment. Satan is the father of all lies. When liars lie, they are following after their father. It is satanic. Notice verse 9. When they come up on the breadth of the earth and surround the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Now listen carefully. What John is seeing, he is seeing in this vision, the holy city now arrive on earth. He is seeing that when the presence of God comes on this earth, like at the second coming, he's seen the holy city come down and he has seen all of the wicked resurrected again. They've all come back to life and now the question is this, when they came back to life, did any of them change their mind? Did any of them repent of their evil and their wickedness? Did any of them say when they came back to life in this next resurrection, the second resurrection, did any of them say, no, I, I, I refuse to fight against the Lord. Lord, I repent of my evil. Did they say that? But notice verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. They came up with the same mind they died in at the second coming and when the new Jerusalem comes they come up with their minds set on destroying God, his city, and those who live by faith. Their hatred is unchanged and listen carefully unchangeable because they don't want to change. I need you to understand that that destruction is because sin, the smallest sin retained and cherished, ultimately will pursue the death of God. It will pursue the death of anyone who follows him. This is the evidence that God's judgment is just. Verse 10, the devil who deceived them, the great liar, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Forever and ever is a term that means until obliterated never to return. Is it 10 seconds? Is it 20 seconds? Is it 45 seconds? Forever and ever means until they are obliterated, never able to come back into the universe. permanent. As the fire that came down and destroyed the wicked, it's permanent. Listen carefully. Revelation chapter 20 tells you there is no eternal hell and torment for these people suffer death over and over and over. It's obliteration and permanently eliminated from the universe. If that is not true, then sin continues 
to live on through eternity while you live out eternity in heaven. That means sin is not eradicated. It's still present. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now, let's talk about those works. Because you've heard me say, you are not saved by works, you're saved by faith. Those who are saved by faith do the works God prepared in advance for them to do. The works that they're doing is not to earn their salvation. The works they are doing is manifesting the love of God for their neighbor and the love of God in their hearts for God. So the righteous who are judged are judged according to their works of righteousness of loving God and loving their neighbor. That means that they have manifested the obedience to the law of God. The wicked works are the works of love for themselves, to love themselves and to love the lies Satan told them, the deceptions they have agreed they want to be part of, and they're judged according to their works of evil. Works of righteousness by faith, loving your neighbor and loving God. Works of evil by loving yourself and choosing to despise others. Selfishness is what we're talking about here. This is called the executive judgment. It is the great white throne judgment of God in Revelation verse 20. Which one of those people you get to ask yourself am I? Am I living by faith or am I living compelled by my own selfish nature. That's what Revelation 20 does. It challenges you to see yourself. Where do you want to be in this story? Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades, death and the Hades is simply the grave, div, div, ah, delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades, the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. Listen carefully. This is the second death. It's not eternal torture. It is the second death. In the lake, gone, eradicated, removed from the universe permanently. No suffering and torture. Notice verse 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This means there is no such thing as a literal eternal burning hell. That comes from Greek mythology and Greek philosophy. There is only the second death, a death which means never, never able to return. There is no resurrection from the second death. Ever. It's very simple, isn't it? This theological concept to scare people into the church by using e eternal hellfire, do you want to burn over and over and over forever and ever, is such a distortion of the character of God. Such a distortion of the truth of God. Because here John is setting the record straight. God is saying, today I want you to know that I will remove sin so it can never rise up again, ever. Will you love me and accept my redemption by faith alone and sit at my table? He's giving you that invitation here in chapter 20. Our last picture today. I love this picture. I can still hear those waves crashing over the rocks. Uh, north coast of California, those great stacks out there. Um, man, I'm just ready to like go back. I believe these pictures were taken in December a number of years ago. Sherry, I want to thank you so much. Just makes my heart long to go back and just sit and just listen to the waves crash on the shore again. So thank you, Sherry, for your ministry. Thank you for listening. I hope you find good news in Revelation chapter 20 today. Blessings to you.